Welcome everybody to um, our September 2017 Ask Me Anything. We are very excited tonight. You have our very own Dr. James Basham uh, in the hot seat, I mean in the spotlight. So this is our chance to really ask uh, questions of all, kind, all, all kinds of questions of Jamie. Um, he is uh, going to share his insights with us. I'll share with you just a little bit about um, what we're going to do this evening before we dig in. So um, we are here and we'll be taking Twitter questions at hashtag UDLIRN. So if you have some uh, questions you'd like to ask Jamie, we have Brian Dean who is um, monitoring the um, Twitter feed and Corinne Howard will be monitoring our live chat. So send your questions to UDL IRN. I'll be monitoring tonight's event. My name is Sue Harden and I'm pleased to have you here with us this evening. Um, we will ask some questions and um, share some ideas and get some answers from Jamie. So we're really looking forward uh, to this evening's event. So um, what we're going to do, we'll start with a, a brief introduction of Jamie. I'll sh stop sharing my screen in just a moment. Um, uh, then I'm gonna ask a few questions to get us started. Um, and then um, we all take questions from the crowd. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Jamie's UDL passion and uh, we're gonna end talking a little bit about his UDL legacy and ask for some final thoughts from Jamie. So let me just uh, jump out of this and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, we'll talk to Jamie live after I do just a very brief introduction. So um, this, we are bringing you tonight, Dr. James Basham. He is the co-founder and chief executive officer of the UDL IRN and a professor at the University of Kansas, associate professor at University of Kansas. Um, uh, Dr. Basham has uh, extensive experience with universal design for learning. He speaks nationally um, and internationally on the topic, uh, keynote speaker as well uh, as a researcher and writer on the topic. Um, so Jamie, I'm gonna let you take it from here and uh, just do a little introduction. Uh, this is your chance to kind of tell us who you are and we'll come back around and ask some uh, guided questions to hear what you think about UDL and the, and, uh, the state of education uh, across the country and across the world. So you're on. Okay, Sue, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is an interesting idea to do tonight. I didn't ever anticipate doing one of these, even though we've been hosting things like this for the last year, year and a half. Um, so I, I'm honored that uh, the PD committee asked me to actually uh, sit in one of these. Um, I'm usually on the observer side. Uh, so, like Sue said, I'm Jamie Basham, um, co-founder of the IRN, uh, associate professor at the University of Kansas, and I'm on the ground all over the country and world, sort of working towards implementation on UDL as well as conducting research. Um, I'm lucky enough, I've, I, I often say I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to see education in various countries and various states and various districts and how it actually operates and what it actually looks like. And I get to work with teachers as well as uh, kids and educational leaders at varying levels to support um, transformational changes in, in their classroom environments. So is that good enough for you, Sue? That is awesome. So we're gonna start out with just a question, Jamie, sort of of your background and your journey uh, from, from where you started at, your interest in UDL and how you got to where you're at today. So we're just curious about if you could share with us, what are your underlying beliefs about uh, learning and education and how did they lead you to thinking about um, and leading around universal design for learning? Okay. Well, I mean, I can start way back. <laughs> um, I was probably one of the first kids that was identified. I mean, I don't know by number under under uh, 94, 142 is having a learning disability um, back in the mid 70s. Um, and so I did first first grade twice. That was the one of the interventions that they decided upon. <laughs> um, so I did first grade twice uh, and, you know, walked the balance beam and did all the stuff that we did in the mid 70s with kids with learning disabilities. And um, you know, was at that time still very observant. I still remember as a kid, there was a school across the way from us that we occasionally did projects with. And 
the kids, you know, had significant sort of disabilities and, and that kind of tugged on me as, even as a kid, I, I would, and I volunteered time there a little bit, even in younger years. Well, then we moved to another state after I did first grade, like in my second grade year, I third grade year, somewhere in there. And um, so I received, continued to receive services. And then after a couple of years, basically the team came back and said, yeah, we know you have dyslexia, but you're cured now. So um, you don't need any services any longer. So, <laughs> so I, I kind of walked through life uh, academically um, kind of struggling, obviously, uh, as you might imagine, with really little to no support. Uh, I come from a family that's, uh, you know, a blue, a blue collar working, working class family um, and just made a buy. And so it came down to going to college. And I, at one point in time, was quite athletic and was offered some scholarships and such and uh, decided not to do that because I, I remember to this day telling my mom in the kitchen that I want to go off and, you know, kind of change the world and change the way education works. And, and uh, I can't do that if I was in, had scholarships because <clears throat> I decided I hadn't learned anything in high school and I better learn something in college. So, uh, so <clears throat> like any mom probably would at that time, although she denies it now. And if she's watching, I'm sorry, mom, but uh, she said, you know, why don't you go down and put an application at the plant with your dad <laughs> tomorrow and you know he, he'll probably get you on there and this and that and but I ended up going to a junior college and working my way through and kind of paying kind of paying my way through and parents helping when they can and uh, got into education kind of pretty quickly um, thought and you know read some of John Dewey's early work as as a freshman in college and said my god we need to why aren't we doing that in school <laughs> you know um, so kind of very geeky and nerdy, I guess, in that, in that respect. Uh, uh, fast forward a number of years, um, you know, graduated in special education as a teacher, uh, went straight through to my master's degree while at the same time I was teaching homebound and hospital setting and was introduced to like, like many people in UDL through the AT, through the AT world. And uh, one of my young men that I was working with um, in a nursing home setting was quadriplegic on a trach with a ventilator. And I realized I was supposed to be helping him get his GED. He was a gunshot victim. I was supposed to be helping him get his GED and um, didn't, I realized I didn't have a way to understand how to communicate with him, nor could he communicate with the world. And he was kind of on his own in this nursing home and, um, and had no friends to come visit him. And so I was kind of shocked by the fact that I, as a special educator, didn't really know what to do with this young man. And so, and nor did I know anything about it, assistive technology. Um, I was a newly minted teacher and I did the only thing I knew how to do, which is I went to the library <laughs> and uh, I went to the library and looked things up and found out this thing called AT, which got me into at that time, the internet was before the web even and started, you know, trying to figure out and working with engineers to, to outfit this kid with some early communications devices, head pointers. And at that time, lasers were the, you know, there were thousands of dollars and, and set them up and then worked on finding him to not only beyond getting his GED, I wanted him to have a um, um, active social life. And so worked on designing and, and supporting a Sega system at that time that was, on switches and stuff that he can control. So I got into thinking about technology and education from that frame and worked on my master's degree and looking at kind of technology uses in education and found that, that we know actually a lot and that technology in and of itself was quite underutilized. You know, uh, this is very early nineties uh, in schools, still is in many, many schools. Um, and just kind of got obsessed with that. And I kind of always had a liking and and in that area. And I didn't tell you all those stories and I won't, don't have time tonight, but um, th then kind of got the master's degree, went off and taught. And, uh, you know, the first, one of the first, uh, first 
I guess, uh, teaching uh, job in, in a school outside this, you know, homebound hospital nursing home setting was um, at a high school setting wherein um, I spent a half day doing inclusionary consultants. So I started off with biology, uh, co-teaching biology, then I co-taught algebra, then I co-taught geometry, and then I think I did prep time or something. But then I had to reteach science in the afternoon. And so I walked in the first day and I said, you know, great, where's my lab equipment? Where we have to do science and get these kids active and this and that. And, and quite literally, the person laughed at me and she said, the books are in the closet. And so we went through the process and, and I've told this story many times, but the books literally said in the next few years, we'll be landing on the moon. And this was, this was like the early, you know, mid nineties by this point. And I was just floored by that. And so we kind of quite literally tore up the books, not a good move as a first year teacher, um, but quite literally tore up the books and threw them in the trash just, you know, cause Dead Poet Society had come out and I thought that was one of the coolest scenes ever. So we taught, um, we taught that year, uh, I had 446 computers split on a 14-4 modem at the, in the tech prep computer lab. And man, we thought we we're living large. So I taught the entire year based on some sort of inquiry project and problem-based sort of what we know is today is problem project-based um, sort of um, high interest things. And my kids went down and would pursue questions and stuff. And I still remember to this day, uh, you know, search the kid wanted to do something on solar panels and, and, um, and he came up to me and he had this, we had this little sheet that they filled out, like, here's what I want to do da, 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 for the week or a couple of weeks. And I thought, my God, I, I sure hope, I sure hope that the web has something that's visual and great on solar panels. Cause <laughs> you know, so we did that. And then a couple of years, a year later, I was recruited off to a larger district and, and kind of was used technology again to um, work with younger kids, um, fourth, fifth, sixth graders for a few years and, and worked there for a number of years. And, and finally, I just kind of got active in thinking about kind of national policy and doing some work actually with CEC at the time on, on federal law reauthorization. And um, so we spent some time in DC, et cetera, and which kind of got me thinking bigger picture, like, all right, I've got that, you know, I want to influence my class every year, but I want to do something more, right? I was, I was kind of still feeling that frustration that I had as a kid, but then it continued to build. And so I went back and got my doctorate and uh, um, got my doctorate. And within the first semester, I saw this little newsletter um, come, come out that it was kind of the announcement that this new thing called UDL is hitting, hitting the, hitting the, hitting the, you know, in, hitting schools around the country. And it was one of the first, it was, I think, 1999 or something like that. And, um, or 2000 or something. And, uh, I brought it to my advisor and said, you know, I figured out what I want to study. Here's what I want to study. And they kind of laughed at me and they said, we, we don't do that here. <laughs> So I advanced to, um, you know, uh, really kind of designing my own doctorate between special education and educational psychology. So I worked with extreme behaviorists and, and cognitive sort of folks. And from there went on to um, do other things. So I don't know if that answers your first question. I can't, I have to write these things down. No, that was my question. You did a, a marvelous job. Um, the question really was just what are your underlying beliefs about learning and how did you end up with UDL? So I think you addressed that yeah, uh, very bit. well. I, I just want to comment that, you know, it's really obvious that your um, passion comes from a real personal place. Uh, and I think that's really important. It shows in your work and it shows in your answer and uh, shows in the way that you're leading uh, the new sort of re revolution, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, I think that we're lucky that you turned your back on sports and turned it toward uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> turned it toward education and um, found, found your partner in crime, uh, Jeff Diedrich, and decided you're going to blow up education. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question, Jamie, to your comment, you know, that the, I, I think it's really uh, interesting that UDL started to show its face in, in the year 2000, um, 1999, 2000. That's really 17 years ago. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a long journey and, you know, and it's uh, been a bumpy one, I, I would say. Um, just in your words, how would you describe why the adoption of UDL has taken uh, as long as it has? And do you see us moving in a trajectory where that is changing so that uh, we're seeing more uptake in this idea of universal design for learning and more schools are uh, adopting it as a framework for instruction? Mm -hmm. So that was two questions. Yeah, it's two questions. And jump in and remind me if I get off track. Um, I so I think it I think it's taken a long time because I think it's a transformative change, right? It's not an incremental change. We're really asking schools to really rethink, to really rethink, you know, what it means to to design a learning environment and to implement a learning environment, right? We're rethinking actually how learning takes place in schools. And that's a hard, that's a hard change for schools to take on. Um, <clears throat> schools, as most people know, are used to taking sort of baby steps in, in implementing things. And this is a this huge step. Um, it also is not a nice and shiny object, right? It's kind of a messy object. It, it, it UDL as a framework means that that you're approaching, that, that it's not a single strategy that you're gonna use on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not in the box sort of model. Um, and so it's taken a long, it's taken a long time, um, but it's amazing. So I was thinking back today, actually on the way home, I was you know, thinking about doing this thing tonight. And I was lucky enough to uh, be given an opportunity uh, probably 2006, 2007 to implement a UDL based school. Um, you can hear the dog. <laughs> um, so he's excited about something, obviously, right? Um, so is it overpowering? No, it just adds authenticity. You're fine. Just it adds up. authenticity. So I'll pull the mic a little closer. How's that? So um, the the you know in 2007 i was able to go in and lead a, a school in implementation of a udl based stem model and do a, a school reform around around um uh, the dog's really distracting me <laughs> but around a, it was an nclb shutdown a school that's being shut down so for people out of the country that don't know and uh, no child left behind um after a number of years of failing, a failing school as, as, as defined by test scores was required to shut down and then reopen. And, and so I was given an opportunity to help lead a team and to really lead a team around um, one of the first schools in Ohio, well, in a state, I guess it, Ohio, to shut, to shut down and reopen. Um, and so we had, we, we shut it down in June and reopened in August and, and in between June and August, we had to kind of re-outfit the school, uh, the, the physical plant of the school that, you know, and change the, that piece of it. But then also pro provide professional development and professional learning to the staff on not only UDL, but also STEM education and to redesign and remodel the school. And so we had that opportunity, but what was interesting about that is for the first time I had the opportunity to look at this at a larger scale and I got to see the teachers kind of come into it. And the teachers, although this has taken a long time for us to grasp in education, as soon as the teachers, even back then, they, they started the implementation process, they said, this is why we went into education, right? This is, this actually, this is, we feel like we're actually doing something. We're feeling like we're doing what we meant to do in education. And so we, you know, and I found that over and over again, like from that first, that first implementation through what we're doing today and working in schools, teachers just, they just gravitate towards it, right? And, and, and administrators even gravitate towards it. So I think once we get it going, it, it starts rolling. And so your second question is, is it taking off? And the, and the short answer is yes. It's, we're starting to see some growth. Um, we're starting to see some growth and that's, and that's an, important, an important thing that we need to have to continue to happen. And so that's actually one of the reasons one of the reasons we started the IRN and, and we're working closely with CAST and other organizations around the country 
um, and around the globe to, to support that growth because you know we, we not only believe in it, but we have seen the results. And so that's what's important. Perfect. Thanks, Jamie. So um, I, I, I don't know if you remember, but I had an opportunity to see that school mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Oh, I had forgotten about that. Yeah. 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 So, um, so it, it was incredible how much of a transformation you guys had made in just such a short time and the passion that everybody had about implementing the UDL with Fidelity. Well, what was interesting about that school um, is that, you know, within the first semester, Actually, we, and we had people walking through the school all the time. People, in, I, we call them suits, right? We'd have suit walks. And there was usually people from, you know, governor's offices or congressional offices or the State Department. And we would have these people in these um, come through and they would say the, the environment's a different environment, right? We, we know it's a different environment. We're feeling it's a different environment. You know, how did, how did this happen? And we would talk to them through it and we'd have kids and the teachers both explain. Um, so what, what was interesting though, is within the first three to four months, the school district was a district of choice, which means that parents could choose where they sent their kids to school. And the district office, I got called to the district office within that first semester. And, and uh, they said, we have a problem. I said, okay, and what's the problem? You know, and it wasn't on, it's, you know, these large districts, I mean, there's always a problem somewhere, right? So we're always solving problems. So they said, one of the major problems is, is we have the, the, the parent support center is getting calls that they want to transfer kids to your school. <laughs> and we don't know what to tell them. And I said, send them. I mean, we want more kids, right? Because there's a whole long story to this and I'd, I'd be happy to send people a book chapter on it or whatever. Um, but um, they said, but you're still the lowest performing school in the state <laughs> and parent, but parents are like, we want to be there. <laughs> so, um, but you know, we, we, we performed outperformed ourselves every year that we were involved and we were there a couple of years. So, um, we can talk more about that, but I, uh, I think it's funny that, that they saw that as a problem that they wanted kids to come to your school. I mean, what a great problem to have, right? I mean, that's what we're all striving for as parents asking for kid, for to send their kids to our schools. So um, we've got some questions coming in from our participants, uh, from the audience, Jamie. So I am gonna throw it over to Corinne. She's been monitoring the chat and the Q&A. Um, so Corinne, if you've got a, a question you'd like to shoot Jamie's way, I'm gonna mute my mic. And if you unmute your video and unmute your mic, we'll hear from uh, questions from the audience. Sure. All right. Thanks, Sue. Um, so, Jamie, based on that that last uh, statement that you were talking about, the teachers really getting into you, this UDL is the why they got into teaching. There is a question um, that says, um, which I think is a really good point. How do we get systems to support teachers in getting back to why they got into teaching in the first place? So, like you said, teachers really UDL resonates with those teachers who feel like they've lost some of that voice and autonomy. How do you support the systems into buying into that? You know, I think it's, I think it's getting, getting the leadership to look at school teachers differently. I think, and we, as we, as a profession um, have kind of lost ground in that area. Right. So one of the things I think we really have to think about is uh, who are we as a profession and, and the way we prepare teachers and is not, you know, in many places they're treated as factory workers. They're, they're treated as, you know, that they're putting out little widgets. Um, that have, you know, standard, standardized controls around them. Um, and, and that's something that we've, we have to get away from. And what UDL does is encourages uh, teachers to think like what I call learning engineer or a designer. And when, um, when administrators see that, when they, when they get to experience that, I think, I think they appreciate it. It's not, but, but we as a profession have to stand up to that, right? We as a profession, I think, really have to say, here's what I, here's what I can do, here's what I can show. And, we, and in fact, we, we should be fighting against the opposite. We should be fighting against the people that don't give us the opportunity to, sh to show uh, ourselves as professionals. Um, it, but it, it's, it's, it, um, it, it's, it's, it's a hard process. I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, 
it, it, there's not a really a, a, a nice answer to it. Um, but it, you know, unless we unless we stand up for ourselves, it's not it's not going to change. Yeah, I agree that we just we have to just really be strong advocates for what we know is right for kids and um, and make sure that our leaders, our administrative leaders are paying attention and coming into the classrooms. Right. That might that's one solution. Come and see it in action and see see what it looks like when we do it a different way. I mean, I think that's the, the key. Right. Like I, I still remember that first school one of the things that happened is we did have a lot of growth. And so we had to hire a bunch of new teachers that after the first year um, and the teachers were like, well, you know, uh, the grant had run out. So we didn't have enough money to pay teachers an entire summer salary to, 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 to go through professional development. And so they said, well, we're going to screen out the applicants. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? They said, well, um, why don't you uh, give us a week and come back? And so we, we, we went a week and we came back. And the teachers had developed at that time, I think there were CDs, that basically they were going to make the applicants watch that basically said, here's how we here's how we behave in our school. This is what it means to be a teacher in our school. And and, and I said, well, you know, it's a, it was a highly regulated district as far as uh, following protocols for interviews. And it was part of the teaching agreement. And the principal and I were stood there and they said, well, you guys don't do anything. You guys don't have to be involved in this because the, the videos were just amazing, right? So, and so they would literally have the, the applicants come in. Uh, the teachers would have the applicants come in and said, uh, just wait a second, we're running behind, watch this movie and then uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. <laughs> So they were screening them by showing them, this is how we want, this is what it means to be a teacher in our school, right? I mean, and you have to think these teachers that we recruited, they had a passion for it because they're, they're, we were recruiting them. The recruitment was, you know, come to the lowest performing school in the state. We're gonna transform it. We'll give you a laptop and you get to lose your summer, but we'll pay you, you know, so. I really like that idea of that sort of uh, subliminal indoctrination into the good stuff. That's kind of subver subversive, <laughs> but I like it. Can you have any other questions? Um, yeah, we do have a couple other questions. So um, another question coming in from um, Deb in the chat um, related to universal design and higher education, a couple of them actually. Um, one kind of along the li same lines in terms of how um, to, to convince that higher education, um, both administrators and faculty um, around UDL, um, to increase student success and that retention, you know, keeping kids in the in the college scene, um, especially with the she mentioned the the research support, um, the limited research support around UDL and, and higher education, and um, and then a second a follow up to that, um, if you do do that, if you're able to kind of get people to buy in higher ed buy into that, then how do you present or teach UDL to um, an undergraduate class? studying universal design, particularly if they're not education majors. Wow. wow. <laughs> um, Didn't start so, with the easy one, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, many, many of our K-12 friends out there may not know this, that UDL most recently was ranked as the fourth largest issue in higher education today across the United States um, by Educause. And so um, it's hanging right on my door outside my office. And so we are getting, we're picking up a lot, we're picking up a lot of ground very quickly in, in higher education. Um, and it's, it deals with accessibility, but it's also just deals with UDL. So the buy-in, um, the buy-in is kind of an interesting one right now because, you know, I think there is buy-in on most campuses at some level. Um, it's probably, unfortunately, at their disability office. Um, but we're seeing a lot of people in, in higher education that are, that are looking at their, their, um, uh, dropout rates, et cetera, and looking at, um, our retention rates overall and saying, we need to change these, uh, we need to change the retention rates. And that's where we're getting a lot of pickup right now is around those retention rates, especially around, you know, as we're getting a more diverse population in higher education, it's becoming more and more apparent that we need to do something about it. And so, you know, I would encourage those who are at the university level that are, that are kind of dealing with this issue 
So you might start with your disability office, but then there's usually a vice provost office somewhere um, or, or someone that you could talk to. But the disabilities office might just have the insight on what's the internal network of people you might need to talk to to make, to make it happen. Um, as far as working with undergraduates, you know, the best way to, that I have found to engage undergraduates um, in this process is to expose them to it um, from a student. You know, I, I practice what I preach. I, I you know, I, I'm one of these people that I, I'm a firm believer in that, that if I'm going to go out and talk about UDL, I need to ex experience, experience it for myself and deal with all the pros and cons to the entire thing myself. And so if for years I've been allowing students to submit things multiple ways, for instance, just as a real basic example. Um, and there's not probably in the last five, six years, maybe even seven years or, or longer, there's not been one class that I haven't had where at least one time throughout the semester, and this is undergraduates through graduate students and doc students, that a student hasn't come to me and said, you know what, this is the first time in my entire academic career that I've been able to finally show what I know. And it's because I've been able to do it in a different way than I've been, you know, I, I have flexibility in how I not only gain access to the information, but also I have flexibility in the way I demonstrate my understanding. So, you know, I think there's, it's, it's, it, we're picking up a lot of steam in higher education. It's, it's just going to expand. You know, I was just thinking that the question asked about research, you know, and, and, and without a lot of research backing, but sounds to me like the um, anecdotal research is uh, overwhelming that if you've got kids every time saying that this is the first time I was as a college student be able to show what I know, that's pretty powerful. Uh, I had an email question come in actually earlier today, Jamie. So um, I thought now would be a good time to go ahead and ask that. Um, the question was, and I this one is I'm curious to hear you answer because it's one we wrestle with all the time. How do schools decide how good is good enough with UDL? That's a really great question. I, I think it's something you know, I've wrestled with in various implementations. Um, you know, one of the first, we, we started thinking about measurement of UDL actually with that very first school. And it kind of gets into that measurement sort of issue. And, and I don't want to get too academic on it, but um, you know, at that very first school, we had outside evaluators come in and kind of say the same thing everyone else was saying, which is, my God, this whole school is transformed. It's completely transformed. The whole learning environment's changed. You know, we went from a PTA, uh, uh, parent teacher association that had no one show up to filling rooms full of people and having to move it off site because we didn't have a large enough room. Um, um, so it's been transformed, um, you know, and, and it's a UDL based STEM school. Um, how do you know what's UDL? <laughs> you know, what is UDL and how do you know? And so we went through that whole process, you know, the, the way, um, UDL is one of these things that I don't know if we're ever done in reality, right? I mean, I don't know if we're ever done. I, th I think it's the implementation process because it, is, it provides for both proactive and iterative design. I think we're, you know, continually improving. Um, and so some of the models that we're looking at around, um, you know, implementation models around continu continuous improvement is, is, are absolutely critical. And so, I think it, I, I would say that we're probably never done it in trying to improve who we are as educators and, and, and who we are as in educating society. I don't know, if, that's probably not the answer you wanted to hear. Well, no, but I think it's the right answer. You know, I, I even think about the field of UDL and, and how much it's transformed in the last, even just five years. You know, we really uh, grown up, if you will. You know, I think we were, there were some pretty, uh, basic sort of infantile stages of UDL it was complex, but it, it really wasn't very sophisticated. And now um, I think when our conversations about instruction are so much richer and so deeper, really start talking about kids and being expert, kids being expert learners. And it's not the conversation we were having just seven or eight years ago. So I, I, I think you're right, this whole iterative piece is not only about the day-to-day -day instruction in UDL, but the field of UDL too. So um, yeah, no rest. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, and from an academic side, I mean, I think if we look at some of the improvement science models and, and um, 
I think it's, uh, you know, critical to, um, it's critical to how we actually process and, and, and improve as a society. Hey, Sue, can I step in just with a quick question regard, related to that? So um, something that you just said about the shift from UDL as a, you know, a product or um, you know, a, a set of tools to use and put in place, Jamie, Jamie someone said um, there still is that misperception out there sometimes that it's all, it is all about technology and sometimes that's how people kind of get their feet wet into it, kind of uh, much like your story. Uh, what are ways that you found to help people make that philosophical shift from UDL as a set of tools or to, are all about technology and just putting technology in place to really that, that you know, it's about design, um, designing that learning environment start to finish. You know, we've, there's a couple of different ways I've done it. Uh, one of them is to, to give them, you know, we, we did some design challenges with low tech. Um, I mean, that's one way to do it in a professional learning sort of environment, right? Where we, we design with low tech. Um, you know, for a long time, I was probably, you know, until we did some of those initial implementations, being that I came from the ed tech sort of world myself, um, I, I probably was coming in with that sort of notion that it's, it, it has a large uh, relationship with technology. And it's not to say that, it, that technology doesn't help facilitate and scale its implementation. Um, but, but we do have to, it's not about the technology at the core. It's about the design. It's about thinking about, it's about design thinking and, and implementing the, and implementing design thinking in schools. And, and we need to actually take people through that. In fact, one of the things I did in, in my undergraduate class, I have some seniors I teach every year and, and they're, they're, um, middle school and, and high school teachers. So they're from various disciplines. And so we do design a design thinking challenge every year. Um, and that's actually one of the assignments that they do is they have to bring it that they have to take on a problem and solve it. Um, and it's something to do with their teaching or themselves as a learner. And we go through building them as design thinkers and, and taking them through that process. And then we introduce UDL as a framework for helping support that in schools. And it, it just makes a heck of a lot of sense to them. Um, you know, um, the technology, you know, I, I think in schools today, we're just so infatuated with shiny objects that that we that we overlook the importance of, you know, having a great design and excellent strategies. Um, because there's so many times, and especially those of us who who kind of got into the technology scene early, we learned our lessons. We took our we took our shots early in the day, I guess, and. We realize that you know I can throw a bunch of bunch of technology at something and it doesn't make it better unless it has a really great design behind it. So, so um, Karen, do you, are there any follow up questions to that before we move on? Um, I guess just one more question again back to our, our higher ed folks in terms of resources for UDL and higher education. Jamie, anything you can speak to in terms of that? Yeah, I see, uh, I see someone just posted something. Um, I think Kim Coy just posted, Kimberly Coy just posted UD on campus. I think CAST, CAST has a great website for that. There's a couple of others out there that you know I could put together later on. I, I can't recall the URLs off the top of my head, but uh, UD on campus is definitely a, a great starting point. I, you know, CAST has done a phenomenal job at starting to think through that process. Um, and I think as we obviously scale uh, in higher ed, there's gonna be a heck of a lot more. Thanks, Corinne and Jamie. So Jamie, one thing that um, I think would be really helpful to hear from you about is, you, you know, unlike some other um, leaders, you're not only a, a leader in terms of the philosophy uh, behind it or the or just the research, you're also a strong implementer. And, and I think that uh, makes you unique in the field that you have both, ha both uh, wear both hats interchangeably. So a question about in implementation. If you were to give a team just getting started one strategy or one thought about how to make implementation successful, what would you share? Wow. <laughs> I think to me, it, it really oftentimes matters on the context, right? 
So the way I approach, well, the way I approach implementation is I rarely stand up and do, I mean, we'll do the UDL 101 for district wide sort of inception sort of thing, but oftentimes I approach the, the teachers as designers themselves, right? And then I base on the context of where they come to the table. Um, so most recently, for instance, um, we've been implementing a lot of UDL based personalized learning. And depending on where they're at in that process, right? And so we have schools that are just, you know, oh, I've been told I have to personalize this year, or, or I've been trying to personalize for two years and I've, it's a mess. Um, one of the things that we've been working on a lot um, is actually encouraging, it's an odd thing really. I mean, so when we look at the model, right? And this is actually where I wish I would have had slides, Sue. But if we look at the model of UDL, um, it depends which model you look at, but I like the one with the brains at the top, right? The, the newest one and, and the practice theory and practice book. It accesses the, that kind of bottom layer, right? And then we have kind of the comprehension and processing sort of up in the middle. And then we have, um, um, and then we have the kind of the higher order um, sort of at the, at the top. And so depending on where the teachers come into it, in the, in the most recent work we've been having to do is around, okay, I have a, a classroom that I've tried to personalize learning and nothing's actually working. Um, so what can you do? And so we've been helping teachers go through the design thinking process and prototyping tools and solutions, strategies, uh, and systems in their classroom to help support self-regulation actually for students. And um, that's actually a, a been helpful in those, those situations, but that's contextualized, right? So, but if we go to a, like an everyday school that's just kind of beginning to get on board with UDL and then moving from a traditional frame, I mean, there's not one right way to approach it. That's the thing, right? Because it's design based. So you're gonna design around the variables that, that you have. Um, but you know, oftentimes you talk to building leaders and they think about engagement and engagement's probably one of the number one things you can hit. So what we have teachers do is, um, what I, is we measure, and we, we have kids, we talk to kids about, you know, and, and we measure kids engagement and we figure out what influences engagement, et cetera. And we do high interest, high, and suddenly they're like, oh, you know. Um, and some of the things that you find that I, I thought were, and maybe again, it's, um, I thought I always thought multiple means of representation was a relatively easy thing to do, <laughs> um, but it's not always that easy to do for for people, and so we have to approach them where they're at. And and I, w I again, I w that this is why it's taken so long in education for this to take on because there's not one right answer. It's completely text contextualized around the variables and the barriers that are present within their environment. Um, but we do have to ground them in 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 understanding it as a design framework, and then. And I think it's easier to ground them in thinking about access, thinking about how do we support learning and how do we support higher order skills and then work in, in from there. I've got, I've got um, that PowerPoint up for you, Jamie, if you'd like to share it. I'm trying to find out where uh, Sue is currently. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I, I think, uh, brother, I think you blew her mind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, before she comes back, uh, yeah. Before she comes back, I got to tell you, man. You, you out here in the in the Twitter sphere, you you hit some people directly in the fields. Um, so uh, I think I might end up uh, taking over here and and kind of rounding us out and uh, finishing up where we're going. But um, I do want right. to, yeah. Great, and Corinne's uh, on too. I see. Yeah, is, is she just uh, so uh, Sue just sent me. Uh, she's getting back on in just a moment. Uh, it's storming out here in Michigan, so maybe that's part of it. But uh, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not in my usual garb. I'm, I'm just kind of a T-shirt and um, T-shirt today. But I got to tell you, man, there's there's a there hasn't been very many questions out here in in uh, the Twitter, the Twitter sphere. But what you have what you have done tonight is you've you've given people a lot of inspiration, Jamie. Uh, and, and people are quoting you left and right, uh, blowing up the feed. So so I'm really, really uh, excited to, to see that happening. Um, but there is one question, and, and that question um, comes from Kathy, and I got to pull it up. Uh, and uh, her question, let's see, yeah. Uh, when teachers, uh, from Kathy Brazo, uh, when teachers are already doing things that, which are UDL, how can leaders motivate, 
them to push themselves to do even more. So we, we spent a lot of time talking about students and, and how students need grid and that, that's part of executive functioning and how do we find intrinsic motivation, but how do you do it with teachers? How do leaders push their teachers? So there's a couple of different things and I don't know if she actually means that they're already implementing UDL or they're just yeah. doing, oh, they are implementing UDL. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I think it's, uh, I think it's a continual growth process, right? I mean, uh, there's obviously so much bandwidth that someone can handle at one point in time. And that progressive sort of, um, the progressive sort of uh, perspective on how do we, I'm watching the, I'm watching questions and stuff pop up too. I know, I know. I did happens to me too, brother. <laughs> it's kind of hard. Yeah. yeah. The, the progressive perspective on thinking about how do I design? And I think this is where, this is where I think we are moving towards more personalized learning, right? Mm -hmm. So that if we really start thinking about UDL implementation, I think that next step is personalized learning, right? I think that next step is how do we personalize? And I think um, um, the, you know, so that's one way to approach it is to say, you know, how do we make that next step is through that continuous improvement. Uh, and I think that continuous improvement next step for us is like to move to a more personalized sort of approach. I, you know, I find, I find two things really interesting in, in kind of what you just said. I, I love this idea of saying, you know, personalized learning is this next thing, right? Like it's the next iteration if we're talking about design. Um, and, and I like framing in that way, as opposed to saying that it's all kind of flat, whether it's personalized learning or learner, learner agency or UDL, they're all kind of flat and they all equal the same thing. I like the idea of there being a continuum of development there. And because it does promote that idea of, of growing and, and, and constant improvement. But I also think one of the big things that, that I really, really liked that you said tonight was this idea of, and maybe you didn't state it exactly, but it's, but it's there, it's inferred, and it's the, the concept of, of giving permissions. That whole piece, I got to tell you, man, Twitter lit up like a Christmas tree when you started talking about, you know, we have to, we have, to have the permission to, to be engineers, to be designers, to, to think about ourselves differently, to advocate for ourselves um, as, as teachers and as, you know, educators, um, and ask for those things. I think that those two things together, that's, that's really the movement, isn't it? In many ways. Yeah, I think that is. I think the, I think the first, I think the innovators and the early adopters of UDL are really the people that have not had a home, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. they feel like, you know, they haven't had a home or a family and education for a long time. And because they, because they are the, they, they are the innovators they are the people that think different. They're the people that they're the people that are really out there on the edge being learning engineers, being designers in their classroom. And that's the, that's the early, that's the innovators and early adopters. But I think as, as we, as we grow as a network, right. And not just as the IRN, but it, because really the IRN's just a network of uh, people in, implementing and researching UDL. But as we grow as a network, we're influencing more people to say, Hey, wait a minute. That's what I am as a professional. I, I think of myself that way too. And I'm going to adopt that sort of mindset, even though it's used continuously. Um, yeah. Yeah. In society. So I think that's, that's of critical importance, right? That's absolutely critical. Um, and it, and it starts really, I mean, it actually starts in pre-service education, right? We have to really rethink the way we're training teachers. We have to really rethink the way that we are preparing them because, you know, we're, we're preparing teachers as if it was 1967. Right. And, and it's not, it's not really helping. Right. right. I mean, we, what we've added to the flavor right now is, is some evidence-based practices and strategies, which we need to keep, but we also need to have them understand why these evidence-based practices and strategies work at their core. And it's because of the way they're designed. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you understand that you also understand how you can modify them in certain situations based on the context that you need them. And, it's a different way of thinking of ourselves as, as truly professionals. Yeah. Oh gosh. Preach. That's it. Tabernacle. Um, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to drop out on that note because that's, that's that right there. That's brilliant. I, I love that piece. And Sue is back on. So I'm going to go into the background and uh, turn off my video. Thanks for letting me ask you some questions. See you. Right. Brother. Thanks for bailing me out there. I had a machine crash. So <laughs> oh, that's not good. It's good to have friends on. Corinne, it looked like you had some questions coming in. I'm going to toss it back over to you. Yeah, we did have a couple more questions. Um, 
We, uh, Alex Hollenstead asked about if Jamie, if you could talk a little bit about the connection between um, UDL and inclusion in students with, with significant disabilities. Sure. I mean, this comes up continually, right? Like the idea that really UDL as, as, a, as, a, as a foundational framework is really about all kids, right? It's around all learners and it, and, and it, it provides all learners a means to have equitable uh, uh, environments that are based in inclusionary practices, right? So the idea that we can actually educate all learners uh, in, in a meaning and have meaningful outcomes for all learners. Um, you know, and it, it, when we approach learners with, you know, severe disabilities, it's the same way as we approach any learner. They, 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 but we, you know, there's obviously other variables that we're contending with. Um, and, you know, it, it, as we design a system that, that is uh, universal in its nature, and some people have mistaken that to say that, well, it's, it's universal. Therefore, once I design a UDL based environment, I'm done, right? That, that there's nothing, there's nothing else I have to do. But what they forget is a couple of different things. One, design is never ending as we talked about earlier that it's a continual proactive and iterative sort of design process that sets the foundation that sets the foundation for all learners knowing that we still may have to provide we still may have to provide you know very specific and intensive supports for some students right um, and we can put that on top but what happens is when we design the environment from the very beginning when we designed the environment from the very beginning to be more inclusive, to be more equitable towards all learners, the need to support at the intensive level and the need to provide individualized supports is minimized. And this is something that I know the field of special education is struggling with right now because it's really making them reflect, making us reflect. And on what it actually means to be a special educator, but also it, it's changing the way we think about education because there's nothing larger right now in education than the conversation around equity. And that's really what we're talking about here, right? We're really talking about how do we design environments that are equitable for all learners. And when we say all learners, it has to be all learners. Um, and, and that's, you know, from, from gifted to, to kids with severe disabilities and everyone in between, we're talking about all learners. And, and we can't leave any of those students, any of those learners out of the conversation. Um, it's just absolutely critical to that. To that. So I hope that answered uh, Alex's question. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think it did. I, um, I, go, I go back to the comment we were just talking about in terms of context being key and what a UDL environment, um, you know, UDL designed environment um, assumes, right, you know, that, that whole, it's um, the disabilities with the environment, right, not the students. So your UDL classroom can look drastically different depending on those students who are walking in the door, and you just have to continually go back to that, that context, and if, if that context includes students with significant disabilities, then you go back to the framework and continue to design. So, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jamie, we are um, closing in on it. So I've got, got to ask, every Ask Me Anything has um, at least one of the traditional Ask Me Anything questions. Here you go, you ready? What's I don't know. <laughs> Invisibility <laughs> or the ability to fly and why? That's a good one. I think, I think uh, the ability to fly because you know, I've always, I've always liked the idea of flying cars, like being able to go from point to point and, and get there fairly quickly. And uh, Sue, as you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the air. <laughs> so not having to buy a plane ticket would actually you know, bring, bring the operating costs of the IRN down as well as, uh, as, well as my personal uh, finances in, into play. <laughs> so the ability to fly. Super. All right, and we do have a, a, a final serious question and then a chance for you to offer some closing statements. So um, my final question to you is this. Um, I know it's a ways away, so um, we're not, this is no way um, in, 
intimating that you're old. Um, but when you, when you think about retirement, and maybe you don't yet, um, but I'm going to ask you to try to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> what do you hope would be your professional legacy? What do you hope others will think about when they think about James Basham and uh, his work with UDL? That's a good one. Um, uh, like anyone that's overworked and, you know, working 80, 90 hour weeks, you do think about retirement occasionally. Uh, but I, you know, think I'm going to win the Powerball and then the IRN's just going to have a limit, limitless sort of budget to do the things we need to do to, to strengthen and grow the field. Um, and that's really what I think of as retirement, but, um, and hanging out with the kids and stuff. But uh, what do I be known for? I, you know, there's a couple of different things. The one, the one thing I really hope I'm known for is, you know, that, that there's a guy that, that, you know, believed in, and believed in something so much. He, he not only dedicated his professional career to it, but that, that I did my best to, 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 to strengthen and grow the field. Um, but that also, I, I believed in it so much that I implemented it, right. That I truly believe that if we're going to, if I'm going to write an article on something, or if I'm going to stand up and give a talk on something, I need to have experienced it. Right. I, I can't just stand up and say that I, I haven't, experienced it for for everything it brings to the table um and and so i i hope that people think you know you know he's trustful and uh, you know a solid believer and that he's able to implement it as well as as well as talk about it or whatever um at the end of the day um at the end of the day the irn you know we are what we are because of the people I mean, as an organization, most people don't realize that we just we just started our first employees just a couple of years ago. I mean, it's primarily everyone primarily everyone on the team is volunteer, and and so I, I the other thing I kind of hope is that you know we continue to to build. Maybe it's not this network. Maybe it grows onto something else. I don't I don't know. Um, hopefully, it's twenty plus years in the future. But, um, but I, I hope we build a network of people that, that can interact with one another, that we can bring the stakeholders around the table. Cause that's the other thing we haven't talked about today. I mean, one of the primary things that I've learned is that, you know, getting the stakeholders around the table and, and solving these major problems in education is the first step to, to actually being successful. And so one of the reasons that I think uh, Jeff, who Jeff Dietrich and I brought these people around the table is, uh, we, we said, we need, we need teachers around the table. We need education. We need educators, education leaders, uh, vendors, researchers, teacher educator. We need everyone around the table. Let's, let's figure this thing out. And that's really what we're about is the IRN. And, and so I hope people, I guess, um, recognize that, that, I don't know, that that's an important part of who I was is, is believing in people. You know, I really do believe in people. Jamie, I think that that's really true. I mean, I could sort of summarize the two things that you said, that you practice what you preach and you bring good people around the table to do the work. And I, I think that that is how you'll be remembered. It's certainly how people think of you today. So that's, um, it's a real nice compliment. I hope, I hope that makes you feel uh, that we really do respect you and appreciate your work. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I, so for the people that are watching, I've been saying for weeks when, after they asked me to, to do this, that, you know, I don't think anyone's going to show. Uh, so I'm kind of honored that there's actually people uh, putting in questions and, and sending in links and stuff. So it's my gosh, awesome. you got lots of people paying attention. Re really, this is really, it's about, it's about, it's about the network. Really, it's about the field. So this is what I'm going to do, Jamie. I'm going to sell soap for just a minute. I got okay. some ads I have to run. But I'm going to, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think of some closing remarks. How's that okay. sound? All right. All right. So I'm going to um, quickly just share my screen and share a few things that you need to hear uh, about, about the IRN. And hopefully I will not crash my machine again. This is how it crashed the last time. 
Um, so for those of you uh, who are anywhere in the Great Lakes area, or those of you who would like to travel to the Great Lakes area, we'd like to tell you about our uh, UDL IRN Great Lakes event coming up very soon in October, uh, October 23rd and 24th. Uh, it will be held in uh, Macomb County in Michigan, which is an uh, uh, area uh, just east and north of the Detroit area. Um, we're holding it in conjunction with Oakland schools, uh, with Muskegon area ISD, and of course with the IRN. Uh, it's going to be an excellent event. Uh, the first day we'll have three national speakers. We have Joni Dengner from um, Bartholomew schools coming in and she'll be talking about uh, UDL implementation from the teacher's perspective. And then Stephanie Craig from the University of Kansas with working with Jamie is going to come in and be talking about um, implementation from a uh, instructional coach perspective. And Bill McGrath from uh, Montgomery County will be talking about implementation at a more of a systems approach or a school approach or a district approach. Uh, so we think that it's going to be an excellent uh, first day filled with all kinds of knowledge. The afternoon we'll have our featured speakers presenting in breakout sessions along with um, some experienced implementers from both Oakland schools, Macomb schools and Muskegon area schools. So it's going to be an excellent first day. Uh, all kinds of content specifically about implementation for universal design for learning. Then day two, day two is an extension of day one. It's a chance to bring your class, your team, your, your implementation team and um, go through some facilitated design steps to help you implement uh, your and design and implement your UDL implementation plan. So bring your friends, bring your uh, administrators, bring your classroom teachers, come together uh, and, and listen in as we help you and facilitate that uh, building of um, your implementation plan. Uh, Brian and or Corinne, if anyone wants to jump in and add up to that before I move on to the next slide. You know, we're going to be, it's going to, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's, uh, it's that summit, it's that UDL IRN summit feel, uh, but uh, so much more too. And it's got that Detroit flavor. So, you know, you want to come and join that. You want to be a part of that. Absolutely. So, we'll see you. I, I won't even say, come on down. I'll say, I'll just say, we'll see you. We'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you in Michigan, y'all. So you can follow this link to get a little more details on it. We also wanted to mention that um, this summit uh, is um, a little ways away, but you know, April will be here before you know it. Uh, we will be in Florida again this year. This time we will be at a, a, a different hotel, but still in the Orlando area. We'll be at the Doubletree, which allows us to actually have a little bit bigger of an audience. So we're excited about that. Um, the call for proposals is open. So if you have uh, a topic that you would like to share with others about your UDL implementation or research or networking or um, anything connected to universal design for learning, um, we'd love to hear from you. Also, early bird registration, early, early bird registration is up and you can actually um, get yourself registered for the event today. Just go to udlirn.org and you can follow the link. If you find this icon on the front page, just click on it. It'll take you right to the call for proposals and also registration. And a quick reminder that UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Brian, I think it was last night. Is that right? Yes, led by the uh, by the the very powerful Kim Coy, and it was a killer time. In fact, we got a bunch of people on here tonight. Uh, uh, that were there yesterday. So really, really good time. And so the next one's coming up soon. Super, put that on your calendar. And then that's at uh, eight at uh, seven o'clock Eastern time. That's uh, nine to 9.30. Nine to 9.30, okay. Eastern Follow. time, six to 6.30 Pacific. Got it, thank you. <laughs> oh, we're not gonna do the thank you yet. I'm gonna jump out of my screen share and have Jamie uh, give us his closing remarks. <laughs> you know, when you think you should have prepared a, a little talk, um, this is probably one of those moments. I just, I just want to thank the IRN and 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 the and the PL committee uh, for asking me to do this again. I'm just honored. Um, there's so many other people that I probably would have put in front of me, and, and probably including uh, yourself, Sue. Uh, you've been around from the very beginning. You're on the ground every day. But um, it's just, you know, I think 
what we do have to do as a field is and and to grow to grow and and to strengthen UDL is to become involved and to to network with one another. I, I hope that you know the IRN provi is providing that now. I know it's going to get better over the next few months. We have you know a new website that's launching. We have a, a new online platform, and I know some people have seen it. That's going to be launching. That's going to help interconnect people. Um, and we're we're just excited about that, and we're working very well and partnering with Cast on on growing on growing the field. And I know there's other groups out there. I saw that. Uh, 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 folks from Core Education over in New Zealand, I think Chrissy's on, and uh, um, so you know we're really starting to strengthen this globally. But this is we have to you know spend our time doing a lot of things. I mean, there needs to be work on implementation. There needs to be work on on research, and then there needs to be work on growing the field. Um, and and it can't be done without everyone here on this call and and all of our friends and family kind of. Uh, reaching out and, and helping one another. So I, I just want to thank everyone who has um, continues to support support the field and its growth. Thanks, Jamie. And we really thank you for um, being brave. I know we had to twist your arm to do tonight, um, but it was it's important. It's important to get your voice out. And uh, Sherry uh, said, thank you for a great talk. She's even more inspired now to use UDL in her undergrad class. So there you go. Always yeah. inspiring. We appreciate it. I'll try and go through some of these uh, questions. I don't think we got to all from on the side there and see if we can't get some of them answered later on uh, through email or if we have their emails. Or... Perfect. Yeah, we do have email. So um, if you need any, just let me know. I'll be happy to get them your way. Okay. All right. Any closing remarks? Brian, Corinne, would just say thank you or anything you need to say? No. Uh, I go ahead, Corinne. That's, uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks, Jamie, for taking the time tonight to do this. This is great. I think it's, um, you know, UDL is, uh, always has a great story behind it and you get to talk to people. So that's, um, that's always a good, a good way to, to, um, to start to share the love. And thanks for taking the time to do that tonight. And, uh, and uh, I'm, glad I'm glad that my, oh, I'm getting feedback. Corinne, are you, uh, are you not muted? Ah, there we go. I'm, I'm glad that my video is not on right now. Uh, you, you hit me right in the feels, man. Uh, and uh, I must have uh, must have allergies or must be dust in the in the air or something because I uh, I've got some sniffles. So uh, thanks for sharing your story, brother. It was really really powerful. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. And good night, everybody. <laughs>